Time for the report. Jenny Chris examines growing calls for a public inquiry into prosecutions brought by the police during the miners' strike 30 years ago. Nineteen eighty four, the battle lines had been drawn between pickets and police. The ranks opened and out came the snatch squads and the police officers on horseback. Dog handlers came out. And it was with almost a military precision, which is absolute chaos. They didn't have any protective equipment, they just my normal police helmet on. There were stones coming over. I got struck on the helmet and it took quite a gouge out of my police helmet. Thousands of miners were arrested and charged during the strike, which started over plans to close 20 pits. It was one of the biggest industrial disputes in modern British history. It took a year to resolve and left a legacy of bitterness that's still felt today by many of the communities and individuals who were affected. Tonight on The Report, we examine claims of widespread miscarriages of justice based on fabricated police evidence. And we hear calls for an investigation similar to that into the Hillsborough football disaster. Does justice stop from 30 years on? I don't think it does. If I've done something 30 years ago and they find out tomorrow, well, please say forget it. I don't think so. Why should we forget it? So there were about 300 of us gathered here and probably 50, 60 metres in that direction. That's where the police were congregated. It's only a narrow road. Yeah. I remember hearing the sound of glass smashing and then within seconds there was just a stampede. So horses and... Yeah, horses and people falling over themselves trying to get out of the way. It was every man for himself. Former miner Ray Riley was a young activist during the strike, working at Frickley Colliery in West Yorkshire, which was one of the most militant pits. Mr Riley was picketing there on November the 13th, and when trouble broke out, he ran into the garden of a house nearby. And we're standing outside number six now, and I can see a little alleyway going past the yeah. house towards the garden. So I saw the police, and I heard one of them shout, there's one there. So I quickly turned around, but by this time... There were some riot officers waiting and I literally ran into them. That's when they pinned me up in front of this building, punching me, kicking me, trying to grab my genitals. I was hit over the head by a truncheon. As I was being dragged back towards the pit, I could sense something warm trickling down my forehead and I assumed it was blood, but I didn't realise how bad it was till much later. Shortly after that, Mr Riley says he lost consciousness. The next thing I remember is being placed on a stretcher by an ambulance man who said something very nice at the time. What did he say? It's a bit difficult now. He just says, what have they done to your cock? And that meant a lot. I didn't think I'd get emotional. Mr Riley needed hospital treatment for his head injury. Then he was released back into police custody and charged with breach of the peace. He knew that if he was convicted, he would be sacked from his job and could even go to jail. So he went back to the street where he'd been caught and began knocking on doors. It paid off because he found two women who'd witnessed his arrest. Both gave evidence in his defence and, according to his lawyer, Pat Gore, one in particular proved crucial. She was key. What she was able to do was to give some times to when Ray had been there. She had spoken to him and had understood why he was there and why he was sheltering. So she was able to give the absolute lie to any claim by the police that Ray was elsewhere and involved in other activities. The police officers didn't come up to proof, basically. I mean, they'd written statements, but it wasn't clear that they'd actually read them before they went into court. So therefore, you were always left with the concern had they actually even written them or read them themselves. They didn't corroborate each other. They were inconsistent in their own evidence. And I do remember the prosecuting solicitor at the time more or less throwing her hands up in despair at the unreliability under cross-examination of the police officers. 
Well, the magistrates retired to consider a verdict and returned very shortly and just said that the case was not proven. And was that the end of it then? It was the end of it in the sense of the legal process. But in terms of what I'd learned, what I'd discovered, it affected my life and my outlook on life and changed me as a person. And I'm saying absolutely and emphatically that the police fitted me up. Later, Ray Riley won civil damages for wrongful arrest, malicious prosecution and assault. West Yorkshire Police declined to be interviewed about Mr Riley's case, but in a statement they said... While many of the issues relating to the incident involving Mr Riley have already been dealt with through the courts, if there are any outstanding matters which he feels are still unresolved, we believe that it is vital and in the public interest that these are addressed. We therefore urge Mr Riley to contact us or the Independent Police Complaints Commission and the matters will be looked at appropriately. More than 11,000 people were arrested during the miners' strike and over 8,000 were charged, mostly with breach of the peace or obstruction. Thousands were convicted and Mr Riley's solicitor Pat Gore says his acquittal bucked the trend against difficult odds. It felt significant because it was, if you like, a win and it was one of only a few because it was very difficult if you were in court and the evidence was that of the police and that of you as a minor then the benefit of doubt was generally given to the police and therefore I think a lot of people felt quite aggrieved at the outcome of those court hearings. Now 30 years on there are growing calls for an investigation into the policing of the miners strike and the way police evidence was presented. Many of the questions centre on the scene of some of the worst violence of the year-long dispute. On June the 18th, 1984, police and miners clashed outside the Orgreave Coking Works near Rotherham. Thousands of pickets assembled outside the plant. Waiting for them were lines of police, many drafted in from around the country. 93 pickets were arrested and 51 were injured, along with 72 police officers. Among those on duty that day was Cedric Christie from the West Yorkshire Force. On that day we went and we massed behind a shield line, I think four or five rows deep of police officers. I was in normal uniform, I didn't have any protective equipment. We were subject to missile attack, there were stones coming over and some of my colleagues around me actually went down. I got struck on the helmet by obviously some sort of large weighty stone and it took quite a gouge out of my police helmet. You realised that it could happen again because there was no way you could go. You couldn't go backwards, you couldn't go forwards. You were a sitting duck really. One of the miners at Orgreave that day was Stefan Wisoski. I went on spare at moment. It wasn't organised. There was four of us went in car and I expected four of us coming back in car together to go and have a drinking club, but it didn't happen like that. Once at Orgreave, he remembers walking down a hill with his friends, right to the front of the picket line. At first, there was little trouble, apart from pushing and shoving against the police lines when the lorries went through. Then, he says, people further back began throwing stones, which landed on pickets at the front, as well as on police. At that point, the police charged. These coppers are coming up to me like clappers. I decided to run up field out of way. They were chasing me. I got up. I don't know how out. I'm a big lad anyway. And uh, I just managed to get over the bridge. I were out of breath. I couldn't walk. I couldn't run. I think I was just going to sit down. And I heard one policeman shout, get that big with white shirt on. And, and that was you? Uh, that was me. Two coppers there jumped on me, grabbed both my arms. I says to them, what are you arresting me for? And the reply was, throwing stones at coppers. So I says, look at me hands, they're clean. I says, I haven't thrown any stones at anybody. They says, they all say that when they get caught. Are you absolutely categoric that you personally weren't throwing stones or missiles? I can swear on this. I never picked any missiles up at all. Nothing whatsoever. You can ask anybody about me. I'm not that sort of person. 
Mr. Wisoski remembers waiting for hours without food or water. By mid-morning, most of the arrested pickets he was with had already been charged. But as the day wore on, he and a small group of other protesters still hadn't been dealt with. Finally, at around midnight, they were charged with riot. I couldn't believe what I heard. I mean, to be charged with uh, riot, obviously you thought you wouldn't have to have done something seriously wrong, which I hadn't. They couldn't believe uh, what they said. It was frightening. Eight months later, he was amongst the first group of 15 defendants to stand trial. If convicted of riot, they could potentially have faced a life sentence. They really laid it on thick and fast. We were really, really demonised. We were the really bad men. And we wasn't. But that's how I was made to feel. That we're... When I heard it, I thought, uh, we're going away for a long time here. We were there to be made an example of. The Orgreave trial had at its core what I can't describe in any other way, really, than a plot to pervert the course of justice. Vera Baird QC was Solicitor General in the last Labour government and is currently Police and Crime Commissioner for Northumbria. In 1984, though, she was a practising barrister, representing arrested minors on an almost daily basis. At the Orgreave trial, she was defending one of Stefan Wisoski's 14 co-accused, Brian Morland. While preparing his case, she came across a glaring discrepancy in the prosecution evidence. The police film showed that around 7.15, I think it was, in the morning, somebody had stretched a wire across the road between two lampposts at roughly the right height to knock a mounted officer off his horse. Dreadful thing to do. That could have fatal consequences. It could. It was in full view, it was seen by the police and it was removed. So if I'm right about it being 7.15, it was gone by 7.20 or 7.30 at the latest. Yet, when Brian was arrested, the two officers went into a classroom where detectives from South Yorkshire Police dictated to them a scene of riot. What they did was they gave the police officers statement forms and the police officers were writing in their own writing and they dictated various acts of unlawfulness which were going on. They then told the officers to write in the middle under that scene of riot what their arrestee had done. So they wrote a paragraph or two saying, I saw Brian Morland, he was shaking his fist and some other details. What happened in cross-examination was that we were able to get hold of the logbooks from the vehicles that had brought all of the police officers from other than South Yorkshire to Orgreave that day. So the guys who'd arrested Brian gave evidence from their statements that at 7.15 they had seen the wire across the road between two lampposts. And I then was able to produce the logbook of the vehicle, which proved beyond any doubt it was a police document that they hadn't left Liverpool at 7.15 in the morning. So the two Merseyside officers who'd written in their statements that they had seen the wire across the road couldn't possibly Could have, seen, have it seen it because it. they weren't there. And they didn't see it. Vera Baird then noticed something strange about the signature on the statement of the arresting officer. The first officer had a very pronounced backhand, heavy handwriting. And he signed his name and he also signed his colleague's name. Because the proper process is, of course, for the witness of the statement to sign it, to say, I agree with the content of this statement. So what he'd done was, dramatically, he would say he had forged his colleague's statement. This was a legal document oh, yeah. being presented in a court case oh, with yeah. very serious implications. Oh, yes, yes. The bad thing came when he denied it in the witness box. Probably, though, the biggest point is that that scene of riot was dictated to them by detectives who must have known or not cared that they hadn't seen what was being dictated. That was the sign of the plot, I think. That was the conspiracy to do the best to make sure that these guys were convicted of riot. Are you sure that these weren't just honest mistakes by individuals in the heat of the moment in a chaotic situation? It's very clear that they weren't. The statements were dictated. The officers admitted it. They were false. There's nothing mistaken there. Merseyside police wouldn't be interviewed, but told us they'd been unable to find any complaints about officers who were at Orgreave. 
With much of the police witness evidence discredited, each of the 15 cases collapsed, leading to the acquittal of all 93 pickets. 39 of them won a total of more than £400,000 in damages from South Yorkshire Police. South Yorkshire is the force which is currently under investigation for falsifying police statements following the Hillsborough disaster in April 1989. Barbara Jackson, founder and secretary of the Orgreave Truth and Justice campaign, draws a connection between the two events. At Hillsborough, it wasn't corruption on the day. It was incompetence, incompetent policing, which then led to, you know, misleading statements statements being redacted, issues being altered. And we think because the police had already got away with what happened at Orgreave, nobody was held to account, no police officer, no police force. The police were then emboldened to take the same view that they could mislead and fabricate things at Hillsborough as well. And the Hillsborough campaigners would support us in saying that, that it's their belief that that frame of mind had already taken hold. Michael Mansfield QC advises families caught up in the Hillsborough tragedy and has been a central figure in that process. He also represented minors charged at Orgreave and he agrees that there is a connection to be made in the actions of the police. It reinforced their belief that they could go as far as they did, and OK, they didn't get convictions, but no police officer was even disciplined over this. The thing that matters most to them is the fact that there was no accountability for officers who'd plainly broken the law, both in terms of the actual case and preparation for the case and what happened on the day. And it seems to me that this still needs to be rectified in the same way as Hillsborough, funnily enough, same police force. And what I'm also appalled at, which is bringing it right up to date, is the fact that over a year ago, in the wake of Hillsborough, and because of Hillsborough, those miners who are still alive and who still have the memories, and I'm sure they do, and still suffering in a way, said, well, we deserve the same. We deserve disclosure and the truth. It doesn't matter when it happened. You have to investigate it because otherwise you give them immunity. They can act with impunity and they feel, well, actually, it doesn't matter. You know, longer we can get away with it, the better. The Independent Police Complaints Commission is currently scrutinising the actions of South Yorkshire Police in the aftermath of the Hillsborough disaster. It's now coming under pressure from campaigners to launch a similar investigation into the claims that evidence might have been fabricated during the miners' strike. In fact, the South Yorkshire force has referred itself to the IPCC following a regional BBC documentary about evidence gathering at Orgreave. Because of that, the force told us it wouldn't be appropriate to comment. But it's now more than a year since the Commission began considering whether or not it should hold a full investigation into Orgreave, and Barbara Jackson is becoming increasingly frustrated. We've not got a lot of faith in the IPCC. They're not being proactive enough. They're not treating it as a matter of urgency. When we met with the IPCC, the Northern Commissioner, she refused to put a time limit on how long the scoping exercise would take. So it's almost as though it's unlimited. You could say that she was being thorough. We want her to be thorough. We do want them to find that evidence. But to us, they don't seem to have got a plan and a strategy of action to do that. Cindy Butts, Commissioner for Yorkshire and the North East of England, concedes that as an historic case, this is something of a departure from the IPCC's normal work. She's taken on an extra lawyer to help, but admits that it's stretching resources. She's adamant that they need time to do a thorough job. I understand those frustrations. I met with some of the miners who were there at Orgreave and I understand that they are frustrated and that they are concerned and that they want answers. They want to know what happened. But what we can't do is rush this. Quick answers sometimes are wrong answers and so we have to take our time and arrive at the right decision. Not everyone, though, supports the idea of digging up the past. Retired West Yorkshire officer Cedric Christie is among those who believes there are now other priorities. 
it's hard enough to investigate things that happened last week or last year, but 30 years, it's just too long. We can't go back and scrutinise every incident that happened because who's going to do it? And I know the sentiments behind it are very important, but are we able ever to find out exactly what happened in each situation, in each arrest, each minor did, each policeman did? We'll never achieve that. I think personally that you're better placed spending money on things that are more current today. You know, we've got massive problems in the country with terms of finance, we've got reducing police numbers, and there's current inquiries that aren't very well resourced. You could be spending a lot of time to achieve nothing, and I think police resources and investigative resources can be used a lot more effectively rather than something that happened 30 years ago. But those events continue to weigh heavily for the hundreds of people whose picket line convictions still stand. One of those is former miner Alex Bennett. He worked at Monkton Hall Colliery in Midlothian, but was arrested at another pit, Bilston Glen. It was quite early in the morning and I was snatched by two police officers. What were you doing at the time? There was some pushing going on. or they would, Miners would push against the police or the police would pull back, but nothing any worse than that. Were you pushing? I was actually trying to get through the middle line. The union official at Bilson Glen wanted me to go through to go try and talk to the men, not, not go back to their work. But they wouldn't have let me through because we were mucked in hall. And that's, I got pushed and then I was just snatched. Alex Bennett was eventually charged with breach of the peace and convicted. For many miners like him, the criminal records they received during the strike had serious long-term consequences. I was sacked. I just got a letter for the coal board. It was very brief. You're summarily dismissed from the, the coal industry. How did you know it was because of your conviction? Because everybody at that time was up in court before me. They were all getting sacked. There was 46 men sacked. They all had convictions for breach of the peace. The only recourse was to go through the tribunal process, which I did, and I won my case, that the dismissal was unfair. And I was ordered reinstatement, but the coal board wouldn't take me back. And I had to go back for compensation, which I did get. And then I was blacklisted for about three years after that. It was all right if you could get a job, but I couldn't get a job anywhere. Every job I applied for, I was rejected. I had two kids at school, no income coming in, bar an employment benefit, my wife worked. And it wasn't just happening to me, it happened to others. Mr Bennett's case is amongst those now being taken up by MSP Neil Findlay, who's trying to get the Scottish Parliament to set up a review. I have had accounts back from people who were arrested during the strike, people very unhappy with what was presented in court and um, adamant that what they were doing on the day bears no relation to what was presented as the evidence against them. One person told me that they were in a village in the evening, the bus went by taking the scabs to work and... When the bus stopped at traffic lights, a crowd of young boys smashed the windows of the bus. The police immediately turned up and arrested four men who were in a chip shop buying chips at the time because they were minors. Not the men who'd smashed the Not bus? Not the men who smashed the bus. It was a crowd of young boys, but they had run off. I think it was five of these men. Now, there was only four there, but five ended up being charged for this crime. And one of them was eight miles away in his bed at the time. And that's just one of the stories. Was he convicted? Yes, he was convicted, yes. And has that conviction held? Yes, so all these convictions have held. We have other instances where people were on picket lines and just randomly selected, taken away, charged, sacked, no redundancy. Now, these are people who are law-abiding citizens, never been in trouble with the police before, people of exceptional character, largely, who have been charged and whose lives have changed. And some people's lives have ended because of this through depression, alcohol, mental illness, and are no longer here. I hope that the Scottish Justice Secretary, Kenny McCaskill, recognise that there has been a whole series of miscarriages of justice and that he instructs initially a review of the police in the strike and therefore is able to look at some of these serious concerns that have been raised by people with a view to having some sort of judicial process that allows these people to have their day and have their conviction overturned. I think as a society we've got a duty to put right the wrongs that have happened in the past if we can. The Scottish Government declined our request for an interview with the Justice Secretary Kenny McCaskill, saying it would not be appropriate to offer a view on specific cases. However, in a statement, a spokesperson told us... We have long established procedures for complaints against the police to be investigated 
which include independent investigation by both the Crown Office and Procurative Fiscal Service and the Police and Investigations and Review Commissioner. More generally, where anyone thinks they've suffered a miscarriage of justice, they can approach the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission. But it's not just the Scottish Government which is being asked to take action. Calls for a public inquiry were also laid out in an early day motion put forward in the House of Commons and signed by more than 40 MPs. Its sponsor and many of its supporters were Labour. However, there was a notable exception. I think it's right there should be an inquiry. If there's nothing to hide, nothing will be hidden. If there is something to hide, it should be exposed. Sir Peter Bottomley was an employment minister in Margaret Thatcher's government during part of the strike. He says history's shown that when a major disaster or controversial public event occurs, tenacity is often required to dig out the truth about what went on. I'm not trying to say that any possible faults were all on one side. I think that 5,000 people outside a place of work is grossly excessive, potentially very dangerous as well. That's not the point here. The point here is whether police action was justifiable, and if it was justifiable, whether evidence of possible wrongdoing has been hidden. You're quite a lone voice from the Conservative Party on this and you're nowhere near a constituency with minds in it. You obviously feel strongly about this cause. Well, I was sadly present at the Heysel Stadium where a number of foreign football fans died because of some hooliganism and inadequate policing. That led me to take an interest in the Hillsborough disaster and it turns out there that there was whole-scale changes of police reports and an inadequate inquest. If the Orgreave issue has some evidence like that, it's time they're brought into the open. If there weren't, and although the policing was certainly robust, it was justified, let that be said and shown. If there's a need for an inquiry, it should happen. We would have liked to ask a Home Office minister to comment on the calls for an inquiry, but no one was available. We were told it would be inappropriate to preempt the decision of the Independent Police Complaints Commission. However, former Labour Solicitor-General Vera Baird QC believes there are good reasons today to fully confront the past. I'm not saying that every minor was completely innocent of any picketing offence at all, but there is a massive collapse in confidence of the police from this, from Hillsborough, and it is better to hold some sort of inquiry into it that can clear the air, and then we can hopefully restore public confidence. (laughs) 